honorable members of the Merdeka Award Trust founding members, distinguished guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to the second edition of the Merdeka Award Talk Series for 2023. Now before we start, please allow me to give a bit of introduction on the Merdeka Award Trust. For those of you who might not be familiar, the Merdeka Award Trust is all about discovering, recognizing, and celebrating the exceptional contributions and achievements of individuals in Malaysia. Now, these individuals are more than just inspirations. Their stories are a testament of triumph, resilience, and I think most importantly, unwavering commitment to excellence. But before we dive into it, representing the Mudeka Award Trust Secretariat, I'd like to invite Ms. Nadia Izudin, head of the Mudeka Award Trust, to say a few words. Thank you, Cynthia. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon to everyone. To Cik Shairan Huzaini Hussein, the Managing Director of Shell Malaysia Trading, Sindiran Berhad, and Shell Timur, Sindiran Berhad. Yang bahagia Datuk Nicole David, Founder and Head Coach of Nicole David Organization. Ms. Karina Fauzi, the Secretary of Merdeka Awad Trust. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum and salam sejahtera. On behalf of the Merdeka Award Trust, I wish to welcome you to the second edition of the Merdeka Award Talk Series. We are indeed very excited to have you all here with us today as we talk about Malaysian youths and how they can be a force for change and help the country effectively navigate present challenges to realize a more progressive and successful future for the nation. But before we kickstart our Merdeka Award Talk series today on Unleash Your Awesomeness, Overcoming Challenges and Emerging as Winners, please allow me to give a brief introduction on Merdeka Award Trust. As mentioned by Cynthia earlier, the Trust was founded by Petronas and Shell in 2007 to reward outstanding individuals as well as organizations who have made outstanding contributions in their respective fields to the people of Malaysia. The name Merdeka Award Trust commemorates the true spirit of independence, transcending the conventional definition of national sovereignty. It explores the liberation of mind and spirit, the strength of character and integrity that underpins meaningful achievements as well as the creativity and vision that enables greatness. In the endeavor to continuously foster a culture of excellence among Malaysians, the Trust established two main signature programs, namely the Merdeka Award and the Merdeka Award Grant for International Attachment. And today's session, today's Merdeka Award Talk series, brings together two esteemed individuals in their own respective fields, the awesome Datuk Nicole David and the amazing Encik Shairan Huzaini Hussein. And we are also very happy, of course, to have with us today, Cynthia from Astro Awani, who will be moderating the session today. So let us open our hearts and minds to the wisdom shared today. And most importantly, let us leave this event with a renewed sense of purpose, a stronger belief in our potential, and a determination to overcome any hurdle that stands in our way. Before I hand over the session to our host for today, I would like to thank our venue host, Gallery Patronast, for their continued support for Medica Award Trust. I hope you've all had a chance uh, to browse through the gallery today. Um, for your information, just briefly, this exhibition today is especially curated as a tribute to Petronas establishment since 1974. It blends our historical memorabilia, relics and masterpiece from Malaysia's advanced and leading artists. Themed Aspirasi Selangkah Kesetengah Abad, the exhibition depicts its 49 years journey as Petronas gears up for the 50th anniversary celebration come 2024. If you've, not, if you've not had a chance to browse through the collection, don't worry, do join us for a walkthrough after the event and we'll be more than happy to take you through the, the masterpiece that we have today. So without further ado, let us commence with the discussion today and thank you once again for being part of this experience and let us make the most of it together. Over to you, Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadia. All right, we just gave a couple of minutes for them to set up the stage. But I think um, 
it's a bit of an understatement if I say I'm excited because I'm really actually excited to be host because I'm a huge fan of these two individuals. Um, Nicole, that's Nicole David, of course, they hardly need any introduction. Eight time world champion in squash. She's also known as the GOAT, the greatest of all time female squash player. <laughs> And that's not me saying it, okay? This is actually voted by the public in a survey conducted by the Professional Squash Association. All right, and then joining her today is none other than Inche Shairan Huzaini Hussein, also known as Patrick Shao on social media. Huge fan. He is the managing director of Shao Malaysia Trading Sunyam Burhad and also Shao Timo Sunyam Burhad. Now, Inche Shairan, if you've been following him in close enough on his postings on social media, he is a very passionate individual and it's all about inspiring Malaysians, especially the younger generations, to build a better and stronger Malaysia. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Nicole, Dato Nicole and Inche Shairan. <laughs> of you here today. I know that some of you are thinking, like, what an odd pairing. But they share a lot of similarities. We'll get into it. But if I can point out to one thing right now is that both of them represent the pinnacle of excellence, okay? So let's start by catching up on what you've been up to. I'm going to start with Dr. Nicole, of course. It's been, what, nearly four years since uh, you retired from com competitive uh, sports yeah how how's it going well i love it so far <laughs> it's been four years and i don't i actually don't miss it so it's great <laughs> do, do uh, you still actually wake up sometimes thinking like oh no do i have training today or like i, I get nightmares i <laughs> i wake up i have dreams where i'm like oh i'm am i late for my match or something am i in the right hotel that did i get my right uh transport but no it's a great feeling it's been almost almost five years next May, and um, I had the best time. The, the first two years, actually, with the pandemic, uh, it, was, it was a nice holiday because I, never, I didn't, don't get a chance to do holidays like that. Um, but it was a time to prepare. And that two years uh, with my co-founder and CEO, uh, Mariana, um, we put a foundation together, which is the Nicole David Organization, and we launched it last year. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and the objective is to empower girls and boys through sport and education. Uh, we use uh, squash, of course, because that's my sport. And we also offer English classes. And it's an after-school program for kids that are eight years old. And we see them through a five-year journey with us. They are mostly from B40 families. And we hope to encourage more kids to have access to sport, but also have uh, a proficiency in English and to be able to use that communication st skills to go far in their own, their own life in some ways. But also the sports part is more the values that sport has to offer. So I know for a fact that sport has changed my life. And I'm certainly sure that these kids will have a, a different life through hopefully the foundation in some way. That's amazing, Nicole. <laughs> now we'll get more into that a bit later, but right now I want to go to uh, Inche Sharan. Actually, 2023 is a big year for him. He just celebrated an incredible milestone, 30 years with Shell. Ooh, yay! <laughs> 30 years! Most of us can't even keep our jobs for more than three years, but 30 years, 30 years. <laughs> What, what do you think, Sharon, has been the key to your long and successful career at Shell? First, uh, I feel truly blessed. When I first joined Shell uh, 30 years ago, I thought I was going to stay for two or three years and move on. Eh? Uh, but I found a company that uh, share the same principles and values that I feel good at. And Dr. Nicole mentioned about the two years where you get to chill out a little bit. Uh, and that was the opposite for me uh, because the, during the pandemic in the oil and gas sector, Petronas too and Shell, we had to figure out how to serve the nation and 
our people when the rest can't go out. Yeah? Uh, and that was uh, quite uh, an experience and uh, that drove me quite a bit to stay longer. And when you discover your purpose at work, then you have a reason to wake up and fight it on another year. You know, I have seen photos of you um, on social media cleaning toilets at shell stations. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is amazing. It's amazing because you lead by example, right? I don't know what drives you. If you can walk us through, like, what? It's actually. Um, I started at Shell. Uh, really at the front line, I was literally running petrol stations. And when my cashiers don't turn up for work, I actually have to go and replace them and it would sneak out like in the middle of the night. And I'm sure my wife was wondering where did he go? <laughs> yeah. uh, and it, it felt uh, not alien to me. Yeah. Uh, and you use the phrase leading by example, but for me, it is actually uh, just uh, living what I'm meant to do. Yeah? And now we have programs so that our frontliners don't feel that they are cashiers and palm attendants. We actually call them side heroes. Uh, our tanker drivers, we don't call them drivers, we call them captains. And we treat them like that. And we'll figure out how that through their work, they can actually be better than they can ever be. Yeah? Much like what you do through your foundation. Yes. I think your journeys are living proof that perseverance and consistency can take you very far in life and in your career. Uh, going back to Nicole, you know, not many people can claim to be the best in something, but you have done so eight times and a record-breaking 108 months as world champion. Do you recall, um, was there a significant turning point in your life that really propelled you to the top? Um, it was the, the first... Part was the decision to become a professional squash player. And I, I really give it to my parents that they saw the potential that I had. And at 18 years old, I had to make that big move. It was either studies or, or go to uni, which everybody had to do. Or I had this opportunity to move to Amsterdam and train with my coach uh, over there that's from Australia. And, um, you know, as parents, you don't just let your 18-year-old daughter to just go in a foreign country and just play a sport and just think, you know, what? where are you going to go? What are you going to do from there, being a sport, uh, an athlete from Malaysia? And my parents, uh, being them, they just knew that if you... We know you. you. If you want to give it 100%, we know you, you will go far. So we, you have our blessings. And I think that turning point of just knowing I'm going to go and do what I love was, was the start. But then when you get there, you're like completely out of the blue. Um, I had to start everything from scratch, from zero to build and become an actual professional squash player. So that, that process, that four years going to be my, the world, world champion for the very first time at 22 years old. That, that journey was the hardest part, but it was what I needed to, to get to then break that ceiling of like, now I can reach for the stars. So yeah, that's you know, the turning point. I did point. read in an interview, um, you were saying that, like for your sisters, uh, Cheryl yes. and um, Leanne, Leanne yes. correct? <laughs> so they are also competitive squash players, right? And yeah. I think I recall you saying that for them, squash came naturally. But yeah. for you, you said that you had to work extra hard, yes. extra long to be good at what you do. I mean, that mindset, that shift of mindset, knowing that, you know, you have to work extra hard. Talk to us about that a bit. Yeah, my sisters were my benchmark from when I was a kid. And, you know, you, as, a, as siblings, you, you, the youngest always want to beat the older siblings. So that was what I wanted to do, to beat my sisters. They were naturally gifted. I was the runner, the, the brute force, want to run everywhere, pick up the ball. And, and, but I learned so much from them. And when I started beating them, then I felt, okay, if I can do that, I can go to the next step. So yeah, that, I think that feeling that I know I can do it, 
And I can, I, I was just, I didn't want to lose. I was just a determined kid. I was very hyper. Um, but something inside of me knew that I was going to take this sport so much further. Whereas my, my sisters just wanted to play it socially or play it competition. And they had another journey for themselves. I just wanted to be, wanted to be a, a world champion. You just number one. Kid, as a kid, And you did yes. it eight times, not just one time, eight times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that was my dream and vision ever since I was a kid. All right. Now, Cheshiran, um, I know that you have a wonderful, wonderful story um, starting off in 1993. But then in your job, it took you quite to quite a number of places. I think that you were in India, you were in Turkey, Italy, correct? Italy. And while you were there, it's not only like you're just there as an employee, you had to lead teams. That must be nerve wracking for you. you know? how, how did you go through it? First, uh Indeed, you are correct, right? Uh, it's nerve-wracking, uh, but no less nerve-wracking than Nicole playing at the age of 22 at a world-class level, right? So I cannot beat that. But to lead a team as a lone Malaysian in a different country, that was uh, quite an enriching experience. And you have to be both humble and yet quite determined to fly our flag high. And I remember after two years of trying, getting the license, permit, setting up the company, purchasing the first plot of land, hiring the first 100 employees in India, when the light was switched on on the first Shell petrol station, it was like, wow. Right? Uh, and I felt really proud, not because of what I did, but because the whole team did. But I just want to share, if I may, just an extended version of that story. After the second and third station, you, you start to get a diminishing level of high, right? Um, and I asked my team, and I remember it was Amit and Toman, and Amit was the um, operations manager, and Toman was the training manager. And I said, can you guys figure out what can we do in addition to just the fourth and fifth station? And they figured out, in each of the city that we were building the Shell petrol stations, there are always an opportunity for us to be part of the solution to the society's main challenge, which was urban poverty. And you can see difficulties for people who had to live in slums, right? And this is where when I hear your foundation stories, my heart really warm. Because my team went all out to find NGOs and these NGOs then figure out youth amongst the slum dwellers who want to work. They teach them basic English, just like you do, <laughs> yeah. right? And then we teach them how to, uh, how to serve customers. Mm. And the fourth and fifth station to my team, no longer just petrol stations. These are places that give hopes to 30 Indian youth who would otherwise be stuck mm. in their poverty. That, I think, coming back to your question about my determination and so-called longevity, is finding a sense of purpose and meaning in what each and every one of you do. And you will have your own purpose, right? As I did find mine in a foreign country. And I, I thought I'd just share that. That's amazing. Um, not just in the foreign country, you've also done a lot uh, yeah. in Malaysia. Um, <laughs> I specifically recall one story, uh, it was actually during the pandemic, where you met a homeless young man who recently lost his parents. And you not only offered him a job, but also a place to stay. Uh, that touched me because, you know, people were suffering so much during the pandemic. Um, what motivated you to just step in and help, help this person? So I was just driving home and I saw uh, a young man uh, sitting on the roadside and he was sorting out uh, discarded things from the nearby trash can and I was curious and I stopped my car at a safe place walked to him sat down literally next to him and asked him what was he doing right and he said uh, he slept there at the corner and I saw that in places like London but not in KL yeah. and my heart right broke down and he was telling his story, uh, his mother passed away and he came from Johor. And it wasn't me who offered all these beautiful things that you mentioned. I reached out to my circle of friends who are 
our, our petrol station operators. And many of them said, yep, Chicharan, I've got an asrama. They're, he's most welcome to stay. And another retailer, Shell petrol station operator said, yep, I'd be happy if he wants to work at my place. And I asked him whether he wants to work. He said, yes, absolutely. So my lesson learned is, Malaysians, all of you, all of us are wonderful people, right? So you just rise to the occasion and think beyond ourselves. It wasn't my story. It was a story of us Malaysians rising to the occasion. I think that's what being awesome is, not just being good at your job, but also being awesome as a human being. Um, with that, Nicole, just going back to you, Little Legends is a great program, as you said, helping B40 and M40 kids, not just sports, but life skills, language skills. Um, why, was this so, why is this so important for you to give back and why this way? You know, what led you to starting this foundation? It was exactly ooh, no, a bit louder. It was exactly the same thing as what Inchek Shairan was saying. It's like I just had my purpose um, by at the end of uh, my squash career. I had two years where I realized that I need to give back all the experiences I gained from what Malaysia has given me and all that squash has offered me, like the values, the you know what what goes into it uh, in becoming who I was in squash, I really needed to give this back to the children in Malaysia. And we have so much potential. Like Malaysians, you, we have no idea how much we have until we really explore the true potential that lies in us. And Inchek Sharan just said it very clearly that we, can, we really need to just reach out to them. So the foundation is like the Little Legends is really about going out there to public schools. So we have four partner schools, three Kebangsaan school, one Tamil school around the facility in Bukit Jalil in the golf club. And we have three squash courts, three, two classroom spaces. And I think we can't wait for kids to come to play a sport and to find potential. We have to go out and get them. Uh, and, and that's when you truly find the talent and also the ones that really just want to play sport and have a social connection to have an identity and now all our 114 kids right now um, are called, they, they feel like they are a little legend, they, they feel that they, they play squash, they go into their school, they have their shirt on, they, they, don't, they tell their friends, oh I play squash, you know, and they, they feel like they have some something that they belong to and that's the whole reason why we have the foundation uh, for them to feel like they are in a safe space to grow and for them to just be happy uh, through sport because that's what made me stick with squash is the community, my sisters, my friends, the family unit that we created. We want to give that in the foundation. We want to make them feel like they are home, they are in the family, they, they can be, they can do whatever they want, but in the right guidelines and, uh, and to listen to their teachers and coaches. But no doubt we, we give that sort of culture, that environment that they, they're always happy. Um, our, we call it the happy place after school. And um, that's the whole reason, that purpose of just knowing that if I can offer something for these kids and they can grow up to be not just champions, but they can use that to do whatever they want to be in their life, whether it's they, they want to be an artist, they want to be a musician, they want to um, be in, work in Shell, you know, everything, you know? <laughs> whatever they want to, they will do it well, and they, want to, and they have those values to carry them for, for yeah. Well, staying on top of your game, both of you, is not an easy feat, of course. <laughs> like, you've done so like over two decades, you've done so over three decades. Um, that's seriously impressive. Maybe for the benefit of our audience here, they might want to know, you know, what's the secret here to stay consistent, to stay on top and to stay true to your dreams? Because I'm sure there's so many challenges on your way up. Would you like to me? Okay. Um, my biggest thing that kept me going was to improve myself all the time. I never thought that I was there at number one. I was, I was set. It's not, it's not a given position. It was something that I always had to earn. I always had to work for it. And there's always room for improvement. So my coach and I, we always look into the fine, fine tuning, the details, the small things that motivate me to get better. And that's what 
gave me the drive to push myself further. How much further can I go? And that was my main objective, was to push myself to, to go and improve all, in all areas, whether it's mentally, physically, um, tactically, technically. All these areas were just refining it. So that, that gave me that motivation to just get, like, put my heart into just working harder. Uh, and the other thing is just, yeah, having, having a vision. If you, you have a vision forward to just reach for something that you don't maybe not know where it is, but you're just going to go as far as you can, that, that's, that's something to work towards. <laughs> I needed a few minutes to think, so that's why I pointed <laughs> to her. <laughs> You're like, go ahead. <laughs> so I wanted to share a, a different perspective, and it's not my story, but 25 years ago, a young lady, a Malaysian, right, uh, wanted to go to university because she came from a rubber tepper family, and she mm. knew that to get out from poverty, she needs education. So she studied hard for her STPM, Sijil Tinggi Pelajaran Malaysia, and she actually passed really well. So she applied for university, and she got an offer from University Malaysia Sabah. Right? And at that time, you get the telegram like there's no such thing as email or WhatsApp. Right? And she felt so happy and so hopeful. She took that telegram, went to see her parents. I said, you know, I've got this offer. I'm can I have your permission to go to university? Just like you. Yeah. Right? And you know what her parents said? We are really proud of you, but we can't afford to send you. Mm. Right? And they were in Kuala Krai, Kelantan, where my home state is. And you know what she did? She said, I would have been devastated. I would have, you know, protested. And she didn't. She said, I understand. She left her home. She didn't run away. She went to work where the current shell station at Kuala Krai. And she worked there for 20 years. Wow. Right? And when I came back from my overseas posting, we, I, I heard the story, I met her, and we put her through the, an accelerated program. Uh, train her, uh, give her all the coaching, put her through the classes, and I'm so proud. Sui Chen right, is now a retailer and she owns a petrol station in Pekan Pahang employing 17 Malaysian youth. I think that's it. <laughs> the type of things right, that we, in whatever capacity that we are, whether you work in corporate like Petronas or you work at NGOs or you are individuals, you, you have to figure out ways and means through the work that you do to create good to other people. Mm -hmm. And whatever difficulties that you will face, and I trust, you can trust me, you will face mountains of difficulties and challenges, whether in sport or corporate world, God will make your path that bit smoother and lift obstacles because you have a purpose, a meaning beyond just what you want to accomplish for yourself. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, That's wonderful. Got me yeah. thinking quite a bit. I don't even know what I'm going to ask anymore. <laughs> but it really was it's so insightful because I know we talk about uh, a lot of people have to rise through a lot of adversity to get to where they are today. We all come from different you know, lives, different um, backgrounds. But I think both of you, what you share is like that perseverance and also now giving back um, mm -hmm. to, to society. I do wonder, was there at any point in your life that, that you had an opportunity that really changed the trajectory of your life? Or someone had reached out? Like how you had reached out to someone? How you have done so with your organization or foundation? Was there at any moment? I think Nicole will have a good story, but I will share a very personal one. And it wasn't so foundational that you speak of, but... When I was 22, when you were the world's champion, I was struggling with my universities. <laughs> <laughs> and I barely scraped through and really proud. And then I went to do my professional accountancy exam, right? And I had to work uh, on 
weekends throughout the day, go, go to school. And I think sports professionals have to do this. You train never ending, right? And in, uh, I was studying really hard. And I had in my article shape, had to work until late night, weekends gone. And I, I, I felt really tired. And I called my mom. At that time, I was in Leeds in the UK. I said, Mommy, do you mind if I stop what I'm doing and just want to work, earn money, and really enjoy life? And she said, Iran, I'm fine. You can do whatever you want. But if you stop midway, you can come back. But I will never speak to you again. <laughs> so I'm forever grateful to my very harsh late mother. All right? Uh, for yeah, for being really strict with me. So I kept going, finished it. Uh, I qualified as a chartered accountant, and I never practiced, but I kept my license and practicing certificate. I pay eight hundred pounds a year for a license that I don't need <laughs> because it reminded me of my mother. Right, so that's it's a beautiful my story. What about you, um, Nicole? Has any at any point in your life, in your career, that someone came in, or like a guiding star or a mentor to re that really changed your tra the trajectory of your career? I, I would say my coach, uh, Liz. She, um, well, she is my my true mentor. She worked with me for 15, 16 years in my squash career. But the minute I went to see her, she knew exactly what to do. She used to be a squash player herself. And she's, you know, there's not many female coaches out there. So she was like my role model. And uh, she stuck by me to, from the start. Um, she knew what I had to do, what needed to be changed. And she stuck with me right to the end when I was about to retire, um, knowing that, and she was the first person that asked me the question after I, I lost in like a tournament in the US Open. It was 2017. And she asked me like, you're not enjoying this sport anymore. You're not out there. Do you really want to continue really playing squash? What do you want to do with your life? And then I was like, how is she going to ask me this question right now? I just lost a, a match and she's asking me this question right now. And, but I think she just knew me better than myself. And that's when I started to make changes. That's when I started to think about the foundation. And that's when I had to go through the process of letting go of squash and being the, the squash player in my mind. But the scary part is that what do I do? I, I don't have the skills. How am I supposed to do my own foundation? Or what, what's out there if I'm not a squash player or number one in the world? As I was going down the rankings. But she was also there uh, to open um, my eyes to possibilities. Um, and also meeting my co-founder and CEO, Mariana, at the time to really um, show that you're, you, if you are a world champion in squash, you're capable of doing whatever you want to do. So, so you use what you have and I can assist you and we build the, the foundation together. So having the right people around the, the, to guide you and to open your eyes to all these possibilities, that was the change. The, the question of whether you want to play squash or not, it may be something that is negative, but it turned around to a whole different yeah, breakthrough for me. And now both of you are guiding stars to other people, the younger generation, which is awesome. Uh, but being a role model can carry quite a weight, I think. Um, what's the experience like for you and what responsibilities do you think come with being a role model to others? Nico first? Yeah, uh. <laughs> During the pandemic, mm -hmm. it was very challenging, right? Um, I was responsible for keeping safe operations when it was very complicated. And at that time, remember the early days and months where we were all scared of mm. the virus? There was no vaccine. We mm. all had uh, really sad news. Mm. And yet, I have an obligation under law to keep my petrol station running. Mm. And none of my cashiers want to turn up for work because they are scared, just like yeah. the rest of us. My tanker captains don't want to come to the terminals. But if they don't turn up for work, it's going to be, yeah, 
So that's I think when I became uh, more aware of the power of social media. So I set up the account and it was, uh, you know, clunky, don't know what to do. But it was my only means of communicating with my frontliners. Yeah? Mm. So I started to do videos like how to wash your hand, mm. uh, simple things. And then I discovered that, ah, I can actually make them realize their roles. Their jobs are not cashering. Mm. Their job is important because if they don't turn up for work, you and I don't turn up for work, nothing will happen. Yeah. But if they don't turn up for work, nurses and doctors cannot go to hospital. Yeah. Right? Mm. So I've, I found it really important that I, in my role that I help people understand that they're bigger than what society placed them. Yeah. Right? And I, I, I felt a sense of usefulness in my existence because I can do that. And today I think not just people who work at Shell petrol station, but other brands too, stop by uh, and want to say hello to me as many did outside, right? So that to me is uh, a little bit of a change in my, in my outlook at life. So we might just find you at a petrol station somewhere? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so what about you, Nicole? I mean, becoming, you're clearly a role model to a lot of people, and especially to young kids. You know, they really look up to you and what you have achieved. What, what do you feel with that kind of responsibility, and what do you hope to impart to the next generation? Uh, when I was, I actually started um, doing pretty well um, in my squash career when I was 15, 16, so I had to learn very quickly that people are looking at me at a young age being role models to their children or to other kids and I'm still a kid um, but I had to learn very quickly that I am growing in the process of representing Malaysia being a, a role for other kids to play sport and to be good, great champions in their own right um, and but in the in the right same way I learned very quickly that I am here to do something for for bigger purpose. And so I, I grew in the process of being a better role model or a bit of a better leadership role as I as I got better in, in the tour when I got to world number one and I got older, I knew exactly that my role is so much bigger than myself. And even everybody came up to me and said, oh, you're doing great, keep it up, you're so inspirational. And to me, I'm like, I'm just playing squash. I'm just doing what I love and I'm getting so much from, the, from my country. Everybody's appreciating me and I am so grateful, but I needed to learn in the process of how to, to be a role model on, along the way. And, and just when I retired, I finally understood that I, this is my place to take on, to have that purpose of taking that role to show that us Malaysians, not just children, women, men, everyone in Malaysia can take like what I've done and also if I can contribute in some ways, um, I can inspire others. So I'm doing my best to reach out as much as possible maybe here or it could be anywhere else on the ground with my kids uh, in the foundation, through my staff, through whoever I meet, I just want to be that role to them as well. To be force of good, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think we have quite a number of young people in the mm -hmm. audience today. And just to keep in mind that we do have a Q&A session later um, in about five minutes or so, so please get your questions ready. Um, I think a lot of young Malaysians today uh, are actually grappling with a host of challenges, be it job prospects, mm -hmm. uh, mental health, and even the prospect of you know, climate change and, and all, this, all the things that's happening. Um, in a world or a future where a lot of things seem so uncertain and bleak, right? What kind of certainty do you think we can offer young people? Chit Sharon. The honest answer is no one can offer you certainty. No. Not yeah. even Datuk Niko. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? Definitely not. <laughs> so that's the harsh. Mm -hmm. Oh no, not even harsh, just the a reality. reality yes. Right? I think I frame it differently is what can we do, right? Uh, to create opportunities for young people who wish to. And you must not impose your wish on others. Yes. It is for me to create the opportunities for people to do as best as they want to be and they can be. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just give an example on the 
India story, the second part of the continuation. So, Amin and Toman went on to develop the next phase. And they said, oh, if they come, the youth that come to work at our station stay and they just be cashiers forever. Right? Which is already really good compared to their baseline. But they wanted to do more. So they created a career progression passport where the first page instead of visa is the first skill, right? Mm -hmm. Serving customer. The second page is planogram, which is how you put uh, things on the shelf so that customer buy more things that they plan, right? <laughs> And then as you progress, you get to become, you know, station manager, you become higher and higher. Several years later, after I moved to different roles, and then I come back, and this was as a visitor, and as a visitor in the corporate world, you get special treatment, and you get to visit the petrol stations. And I remember it was in Old Madras Road, I went off the bus to go, and a lady behind the cashier counter greeted me, Namaskara. And I greeted her back and obviously I cannot remember her name, but I said, I remember you because your dad wanted to take you away mm. because he didn't like his daughter working as a palm attendant at a patrol station. Right? Mm. So that's why mm. I remember her from Bital Malia Group. And she said, I'm now an assistant manager, proudly mm. so. <laughs> right? And to her, that was the best accomplishment for her. And she took out from her uh, pocket her career passport mm -hmm. and she opened it up to the first visa page. Whose signature do you think was on the first page? <laughs> it was mine. <laughs> right? Mm. And amongst my so-called accomplishment at Shell, that moment was my most amazing, valuable, mm. and I cannot find a comparable sense of happiness for her, mm. right? And somehow that I've been a part of her best version. Same like Nicole, mm. helping so many young Malaysians, right? Yeah. <laughs> Potentially becoming the next world champion. Oh, no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know Nicole, I think I know you That's dealing with your story, yeah. 140 kids that you have in your program. I'm sure they don't just come to you for sporting advice. They probably come to you for like relationship problems, family problems. <laughs> um, as, as a role model to them, you know, what, what kind of advice do you have for, for them you know, when they are all like just stressed up with what's going to happen to my future? Yeah, well, we have two kinds of kids. Our kids, kids that are our like eight-year-old, nine-year-olds that want to play squash and have their families, which are also their parents are like same age as me, which is like, wow. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then you have also the staff, which are also a very young group of kids. They are students, former students that uh, did their internships and now finishing university. They are doing um, their full time with us and we gave them the opportunity to work with us full time. And um, a story to tell, um, our, we have a lot of female squash coaches that we took them in as uh, interns, <laughs> but they never played squash. So they, were, they really decided, okay, I'm gonna just try this out. It's an internship. Why not give it a shot? Three months, they learn from myself. I, I will do the coaching and I coach the coaches and then they are on court running the program, learning, uh, coaching the kids. And it's not that difficult, but they, they decided to take that first move. But because we gave them op an opportunity to try. And now we have not just the two um, female coaches, we have actually five female coaches just in the last year and a half because they, we gave them a chance. We didn't think that, oh, you can, just, a, just because you're a squash player, you can be a coach. You can be anyone and you can pick, pick it up just like that if you get the right guidance the right encouragement and um, all our, I think that's what we need to give them an encouragement that they can do it, give them a chance to give it a shot and then and create an environment that they can grow and just be supported. That's all they want. And when you hear the stories about 
oh, what do we do? Like, I have to do my master straight away after university. And we're like, don't, don't rush. Just enjoy, take your time and work, you know, in our foundation. And, you know, and enjoy this time with the kids. And the kids also themselves, they, they just love the encouragement. Just those high fives, like when they hit a good shot. And I've seen the kids, from just a one-year progress, I've seen them grow up so fast. And they are so much more confident. They're standing tall. They are, you know, they're talking English now. Now, they are being more confident, they are playing competition. And we, even the parents tell us that they've seen the, the increase from their confidence level, their happiness level, they are more disciplined, and they are also more focused. So we've heard, we've heard from the parents and we've seen it firsthand. And that is the most fulfilling thing that I've experienced myself and Mariana just throughout this journey. But what more? With, five years, this program, we know that they will be amazing. Just in that short time, how much more will they grow up with their Godi and stuff? Like 12-year-old kids starting to, you know, and then you... Looking at me. Ah, yeah, Godi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the obvious reason. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is the way forward. If we can be a part of just encouraging each other, the younger generation, that they can do it. There is a means to go and, and there's opportunities, there's a, a space for them to have access to it, like yourself. It's just truly amazing that what you have done and we hope to do the same as well. I think both of you are amazing. I need to reflect on my life a little now. <laughs> so I'm just going to give one more question and then we'll take some questions from you guys because I'm sure you, want, you have some burning questions to ask both of them. I think just going back to, you know, uh, maybe back in the day. I'm saying back in the day because we are probably more similar in age. Um, I think back in the day, we do have more time to nurture our passion, you know, um, and also, you know, uh, have that more like it's time to reach the top of our game or whether it be in Korea or whether in sports. Um, but today's youth are growing up in a very, very different world and it's uh, inundated with information, social media. Things are quite different now. You know what, um, how do you think we can continue to motivate and empower them to not just reach for their dreams but also stay on course mm. towards their goals? You mentioned the word social media. I only set up my social media actually for a very personal reason, which was to supervise, observe, and protect my three daughters. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but can I just stop you there? He has 167,000 followers right now on Instagram. Okay? So, <laughs> yes, please continue. Uh, but somehow it got out of hand. So I just wanted to say that social media can be both good and bad. You can spend your life on it. You can also do good and use it in a different way. Uh, I don't allow it to change my life, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, of course, I do spend wasteful time scrolling <laughs> for things that I like. But uh, yeah, like most things in life, just don't let it control you. Do it the other way around. Yeah? Pick and choose tools that accomplish and help you accomplish things. In my case, I don't feel compelled to make posts every other day. I don't feel compelled. And I'm actually very strict. I never say anything about my family. If you notice, there's nothing. It is always stories about my people. The cashiers, the pump attendant, the terminal people, the toilet cleaners, right? It is meant to showcase to Malaysia what we are really capable of, right? So that's how I use social media. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like even from the, the younger generation that we are around, they are so used to seeing what is expected of them. And then they feel like they need to become millionaires at 30 or something. And that, that they just feel like they are always under pressure. So we have to try and be the ones that you know, and you know, eliminate that whole idea of what is expected of them. So, just do, being that the social media is can be tough, but it's just teaching them hard work and making them like work for what they need to what they deserve. It's not 
being like not they don't they now feel like they 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 are so they have to be given all these things like oh yeah I can just sit there and this this job will come in oh I'll just sit there and then this you know like race is gonna happen it's not like that not taking shortcuts not in taking life. shortcuts okay. and um, we have to start really grooming them making them realize like it's not you see only a one not even a one percent it's like oh point oh oh one percent of this one person that is successful being a YouTuber or something but it's not the whole life throughout the whole globe you have to work for it they they are not just they also work really hard so you need to give them the idea that they have to work every single step of the way and nothing is taken for granted nothing is given to you you have to make it happen for yourself and that's where we have to try and change that mindset and to try try and get them out of that social media you know like block that they need to just be there in like next year i want to get that um, that next position at the top, it doesn't work that way. So we have to slowly get that education in as much as possible through our own social medias and, and project the right messaging across. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much for this wonderful sharing <laughs> from Nicole and um, Sharon. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's kick off our Q&A session. I'm sure like the Plenty of questions coming from the audience. Now, before you begin, can you just introduce yourself and also the organization that you represent and let us know um, who you want to answer a question. All right, we have a gentleman at the back. Let's go to you first because you were the uh, first sorry. to raise your hand. Hi, um, I'm Nif from Petronas. I'd like to ask this question to Nicole David. Yes. Um, oh, that's Nicole David, sorry. No um, well, athlete's life, prime time is like dog years. Like it's very short. Um, can you share a little bit about your journey on unleashing your awesomeness in opening up NDO, how you meet Mariana, um, how you start to establish? Because I have a lot of athletes friend and um, we've heard great stories of, like you, Aslan's with his own um, yes. thing and uh, Bangi is still coaching, right? But we have you know, stories about like, like Kenneth's story, sad, sad story like that, people who are still supported by yes and Kabajikan athlete and they do not have a perfect exit strategy after their athlete's life. Can you share a little bit about you know, how you managed to do this, you know, first encounter with Mariana and how you start all this? Thanks. Well, thanks, and you, you said it exactly right. Um, athletes really have a tough time to first um, decide when they need to retire because we always think that we can do this forever and ever and you know, our body will keep going. We are athletes, we can do this for, you know, like till, the, till we die, um, but it's not, not that. And so how do we get to that reality? It's just asking that honest question. Do, you know, am I ready to let go? And once you ask that question, then you have to give yourself at least maybe two years to prepare yourself on what's next. So that's how I was fortunate enough to have the right people around. Um, Mariana is a good friend from squash, a player, squash player from Colombia. So I decided to do some training in uh, Colombia for altitude training because I thought getting older, I need to find ways to help my body recover and altitude could work. I know, but so I was trying to change a different environment and, and good thing I could uh, catch up more with Mariana and she was in a corporate office uh, working in her, her job for 10 years so I decided you know Mariana you're giving me all this uh, information about setting my foundation why don't you come to Malaysia quit your job and then uh, set up this foundation with me so I just and she was like yeah Sure. <laughs> so why not? And I was like, yay! I got good convincing skills. So, but it was, it's based, and also like how to retire. Um, be, like have, she was guiding me through the last years on how do you prepare to tell the world you're going to, to leave. And it's, I was, I was going to go like, yeah, I'll just leave. I'll be fine. I'll just tell people, bye, this tournament, I'm going to go. And she's like, no, you have to plan. Do you, do, you know, you have to make sure you have your, you know, steps so that people can like warm up to what you're going to do and then be ready for the next level. So I learned so much from like Mariana and a lot of people that came in my path and you have to be open to learning. I think that's the biggest thing. And athletes, sometimes we are so stuck in being an athlete. It's very hard for us to break through. So we, so hopefully, in, I think now with MSN, like the National Sports Council of Malaysia, is now having this place where athletes who have 
just about to retire or while they are competing, they get an opportunity to work at different places to gain experiences. Then they probably get into future in their, that, that line as well in other companies. So hopefully we can educate more athletes before they retire to be prepared for the, the world because athletes get so depressed after they retire and they feel like they can do something afterwards but they are in such a low that it's very hard to gain that confidence to do something new. So let's hope that we can reach out to our athletes before, before it's too late. Sorry. Thanks for that very honest uh, sharing. Uh, yeah, Nicole. thank you. <laughs> I think we have more, uh, one question from the lady right here. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. My name is Nora Alwani from Petronas Charigali. So I had a, convers a conversation with um, Pak Chichal earlier, mm -hmm. but perhaps uh, worth to share that I feel very lucky to be here with of both beautiful soul. Mm -hmm. I feel so um, honored and in fact, um, I'm. I think most of us, uh, most of us are holding our tears <laughs> because of the beautiful stories that we heard. Um, so undeniably, both of you are a great uh, human being. Thank you so much. And the first question is uh, in life. I mean, life is always, we are going through the cycles of life where sometimes we are at the high, high, then we are at the low. And I observed myself to be going into that cycle and we had a conversation and particularly, but she said normal. <laughs> That's normal. So yeah. my question is, um, I mean, it's normal. So I, I went through, uh, I'm going through it, you go through it, and you also go through it. Mm. So how do you overcome when you are at the low? How do you bounce back to be the Nicole that we see on screen? <laughs> and also to be the Pakcik Shell that we see on the media social? That's one of the questions. Mm. And second question is that for me, um, I believe all of us in or in gas industry, we hear the word VUCA. It's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But recently, I was told that it's no longer VUCA. It's bany. It's brittle. It's anxious. It's non-linear. And it's incomprehensible. And I couldn't agree more because I am bombarded with all the news, with all the informations. Like, no longer. Like, like nothing like previous. Mm. So then... The things is so much. It just everything we have everything there. So I am always questioning myself: What should I do? What I want to be? What I really want to be? Yeah. So I had I have that questions mm -hmm. uh, here and then, and in fact, I'm still having that question now. So for both of you, um, how do you find? <laughs> how do you find your purpose? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll start with um, yeah. Jeshira and rising above adversity, especially when you're stuck in the rut. So I just want to confirm, everyone goes through ruts, right? Yeah. But when we appear on <laughs> TV interviews or our social media, we are always smiling, right? Uh, you don't put your crying face in front of the public. <laughs> But I have my bad days, I have my sad days, I'm angry with myself. Mm -hmm. And when I go through those, remember that you are here for a reason. You don't live randomly, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I started some of my stories with finding your purpose. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't find it, the purpose find you. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I don't know how, whether it makes sense, but just be patient search for it and let the purpose find you because once you discover it when you are down it will become an anchor that you can pull yourself up yeah? uh, that's number one number two is all this complexity that you mentioned I've stopped reading and I've stopped figuring out all the four letter acronyms because it's way too complex for me the way that I try to cope is just realize that we are a very insignificant part of the world it's a, and if we just focus our attention our effort on the things that we have influence over there are many things that we can't do anything about whether it's going to rain or not today right yeah. but i have a choice to come early or on time and then expose myself to this uncertainty unreliability so direct your attention your anxiety 
more to the things that you have control over. Be grateful when you are at the top because it may not be because of what you did. Mm -hmm. Right? It's God's grace that you got there. And then you feel a little bit more subdued, not too overconfident. On the other hand, when you are at the bottom, know that He is here to help you too. Mm -hmm. Right? Then you'll be okay, inshallah. Yeah. I, I actually feel like I'm in a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wonderful, wonderful sharing. Uh, that was amazing, amazing. But let's Answered now go to for you. go to Nicole. Um, <laughs> as an athlete, of course, you have many losses, many wins, many losses as well. And when those losses prolong, when you're stuck in a rut, how do you rise up above it? Yeah, my I hate losing. That's a, that's that's one of the problems that I wanted to get over was to keep winning. So that's so, but but I had to lose. I had to have um, challenges from my co opponents to then make me feel that I have areas that I needed to develop. I, they are, they were pushing me to be my best. If I didn't have the challenges or the competition or having those losses, I wouldn't learn from those mistakes, those those um, times where you're down. Because you may be winning and you don't think about it so much, but the minute you lose. It's when you analyze what, what happened, what went wrong. So my coach and I will always go into like analysis, video analysis, and then we go, what went into your mind when you played this shot? Or how, why are you doing this? And then we go through it, and then we have to find solutions. So every time when you're down, I, I actually stay down quite low. But in the process of when I started losing, I learned that why do you stay so low when you, if you find a solution and you know the mistake, you can get over it straight away and, and make it happen for yourself. Don't stay there and then it just gets worse and worse and you put yourself down and you beat yourself up. And that's what I did. But I learned in the process that if I, if I learn it straight away, the next day my coach is like, okay, we're going to watch your match. And I'm like, no, I really don't want to see myself lose. It's so painful. Um, but it was the best way to understand, identify, and then, then let's move forward. Because we can do something about it. We can make those changes straight away. If we let it go longer, then you forget, then you don't know what to do, then you feel at a loss. And that's when your, com you, your doubts and your confidence go down. So I couldn't let that confidence go down and not, it, it's so hard to build it up again. So try your best to, to just, when you're down, feel, feel it, embrace it. You know you're sad, you know you're angry, frustrated. I, for me, I like to write things down. And then you know, and then maybe write something that will go, okay, maybe I can find something to do to keep me upbeat the next day. And then if I can go through that one day, I'll go, yeah, I made it through. Even though I was low, but I got through the day, let's try the next day and let's see what we can do next. So those are my small, simple steps that help me get, get that next day, the next day, even though it's so difficult, but somehow it pulls you up a little bit higher each time. And, uh, and the other thing, like just, yeah, I think uh, Patrick Shell just said it so, so well. It's like, be grateful. You got no control over the things that happen around you, but what you can do is control what you can give. And you set the tone with your friends, with the, your colleagues, with the people that you're around. If you're positive, if you're coming out being like uh, encouraging, you will find that your friends or the people around you are going to do the same back. Whatever you want from people, you have to start it up and then you will get that in return. So my, my mom always says that you have to be a good person. If you're not, it doesn't matter if you win or lose, as long as you're a good person, people will remember you by that. So it always will remain as, it, as, as that. So yeah, that's how I learned from my mom, <laughs> to stay grounded as much as possible. <laughs> now, I know we're running over a little bit, but you guys okay, right? A bit more, will you? <laughs> okay, so let's take the next question. Okay. Oh, we have quite a few, so let's, let's go from there. Okay, uh, we'll start with the gentleman first, and then we go to the lady over there. So, uh, hello, Dr. Nicole and Chai uh, yeah. I'm Faiz Yazid from University Malaya. Right. So, I think I have a direct question to both of you. Uh, talking upon my generation, Gen Z, right? <laughs> I think uh, we have this stigma of uh, simply boring doing repetitive things, you know, and we are quite anxious 
with what uh, lies ahead. Uh, and you guys uh, put such stories that you did uh, such a long journey becoming athlete. Even you've stated and mentioned that you've been with Shell for over 30 years. So with this generational gap, you know, how I think in your position as team player back then, and currently I would say both of you are leaders of your organization, how sort of do you instill and manage the sense of belonging in your people and in yourselves uh, towards your organization mission? Yeah, perhaps. Thank you. Sharon, you want to take that first? I, I try. It's a very important question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want, because I cannot help but think about sports now. <laughs> <laughs> when you see world champion in any field of sport, you only see them on the podium or in that final match. Mm -hmm. You don't see Nicole training mm -hmm. every day, hours on days, right? Mm -hmm. And I just realized that because I've signed up for a half marathon next week oh, and I'm... Congratulations! <laughs> and at the age of 55, I said, what have you done, right? <laughs> so, and this is my trick. I'm thinking I should back out. You know, I don't want to embarrass myself. Now I've done it. I've said it in public that I'm running a half marathon, right? There's so no I'm turning now back. Committed now. <laughs> so I've been running even this morning. Wow, yeah. congratulations. Uh, so, not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will text you if I finish okay, okay, it during okay. cutoff. We'll keep track on your social media. Yes. Thank you. But it's on your question. Uh, first, uh, you are in the best university in the w one of the best university in the world, yeah? Yes. <laughs> and one of the things that I've done is I know I will never be good enough to go to one of the top universities in, in Malaysia like UM. So I've worked with the continuing education department and we have actually created a boutique diploma for my cashier's palm attendant who wants to do better. Right? And I mention this because for you to wake up and overcome a problem, you have to figure out the why. And rarely the why is your next uh, salary increase. Your why tend to be about happiness, that you can create for other people, right? Mm -hmm. So in Putrajaya, uh, even the one in, in nearby uh, this place, uh, we have people who are running petrol stations that were previously cashiers. In Putrajaya, Precinct 8, uh, Aziza used to be my cashier. She just finished as PM. And I say this with most love for her. She is always late for her first shift. <laughs> I always have to cover for her. Yeah? Uh, and I remember one of her birthday, I gave her a, a jam loching, the alarm clock, the yellow alarm one clock. from Pasar Malam, <laughs> tiga ringgit setengah. And she's now a retailer. She drives a better car, a Mini Cooper, something, something that is better than me. And you have to learn now, after you retire and after you are no longer in the necessarily the best of the world, that you get joy from the success of other people. Mm, yeah. Right? No longer about your own success. Mm -hmm. And that's a different level of joy. Right? Yeah. And I think that's more sustained. That's how I, I can keep going, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's very different. Yeah? yeah, to your question, I think for the Gen Zs, it's just having more role models to to read up about like like Inche Sharon has just you know you if you see the journey and you get inspired by these journeys you yourself will want to go further and go towards your dreams and goals and then you feel like you are capable of doing that but in in the foundation we give that that sense of belonging and and the culture of just knowing that if you put the hard work in, we will, we will reward you with what you're giving to our kids and we will give you the appreciation you deserve. And that's when they feel they belong and they need to be there for the children. They need to be there because they are committed to the task, they are committed to the job at hand and they want to do their best work. And the, and the minute we give them that responsibility and the, and the accountability that, that they can do so much more if they put that the effort into looking after these children, seeing them grow and become good kids, 
that's where they go. They're telling me like, oh yeah, I want to see them go to university. It's like, wow, you're going to work with us for another 10 years? That's good, you know? So that's what you want to instill. And that's how we feel that if we can give them that accountability and that sense that they are appreciated, that work, their work means something in our foundation. Then even, and they're all, our team is all Gen T's, <laughs> uh, Gen T, Z's, <laughs> Gen, why did I say T? Uh, and they, they feel now that they are part of something much bigger. So if we can create that culture, uh, or if you go into a, a place where you feel that that is the right culture that can be developed, even, even though you don't feel as much, you can develop it. You can do that first. And then it will inspire the rest. You become the first starter of everything. So yeah. Thank you. Yep. Culture. Uh, we we often blame the culture. Yeah. We don't like it. Yeah. But uh, someone thought reminded me this. Uh, a culture is nothing else than a collection of people's behavior. Yeah. And you are part of the people. Mm -hmm. So like that, Nicole said, you. You start the culture. Start it, yes. Right? <laughs> exactly. All right, can we get, I think there were a couple of questions there. Uh, the lady over there, yeah, sorry. Yes. Your turn. So good evening. Uh, my name is Cheryl and I'm a final year psychology student studying Ooh. in IMU Bukit Jalil. Ooh, um, as nice. well as representing along with my friends here, the International Council of Malaysian Scholars. So okay. we're a non-profit student organization. Yeah, so it's really nice to hear both of you speak today and it's been really inspiring. I've been taking down notes. Um, <laughs> but my question uh, to both of you is, with your experience in life and how that now both of you are sort of mentors to the youth, um, what are sort of the mindset shifts or practices that you would advise or recommend to us emerging young adults, you know, Gen Zs and all, when, you know, we feel lost uh, because we live in such a hyper-competitive era right now, what are some of the advices that you would give us to sort of help us reorientate ourselves when we feel overwhelmed by comparisons and external expectations? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I, I just want to repeat what I heard from Datuk Nico. Right? Be careful to believe what you see mm -hmm. in the media. Yeah. It is not the complete version of the truth. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So it's good to see, compare, and be aware, but uh, apply your own judgment. And I think the best is to live the world, get involved in community. Mm -hmm. I get an example during the COVID-19. People were struggling, right? You can't work, yeah. traders can't do things. And what we did was, and I, I didn't do it, I asked my team, what can we do? Mm -hmm. And they found an NGO, it's called Volunteers Unite. Mm -hmm. uh, they set up food boxes. And we didn't do it for profit just to increase our sales. Said, no, don't buy stuff from our shop. Go and look up your own cupboard things that you don't really need, mm -hmm. right? And bring it. And then I saw great Malaysians coming out. They repack rice yeah. into 200 gram plastic mm -hmm. bags. And these are Chinese, Malaysian, Malays from all walk of life. And then I saw other Malaysians coming in to take just enough. Mm -hmm. And auntie came in, uh, to, to, to take something and then she said, uh, pampers ada tak sebab dia jaga cucu. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we took and then I, so we figured out. What I'm saying is, there is opportunity always. Mm -hmm. And the more you are helpful to other people, the more other people, like Dr. Nicole said, will be there when you need help. Yeah. When you discover a sense of purpose, and no matter how small, I tell you, mm -hmm. you will be so motivated to wake up the following day. Yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, you said it exactly right. I, I feel that the generation now has have more awareness in giving, giving back and reaching out, especially during the pandemic. Like, we, we started actually believing in the youth because we actually we took interns from universities, actually psychology students from universities, to, uh, universities because we saw so much potential. They were so ready to give. They were so ready to want to do something to help, to go out there and you said it perfectly, if they can find that they are doing something for someone, they create a community that wants to give and then, then you feel like you can be comfortable sharing the same you know, struggles, like if you're lost or you want to talk about it, you have that same friends around you that share the same 
uh, experiences. That's when you build communities called like network, um, just by different families you meet or different students that you are helping out. That's that's the way to uh, really find that. Oh, I can do something more. Then being being helpful is a, a way of going out of your comfort zone to do to do good. But that good really brings out so much more from you to discover that you can do so many other things. You can gain confidence in the fact that I've done this for someone. You feel so much life from there that that when you get lost, those things really settle you back to reality. And the community that you already created will help you grow as well. And you don't feel like you're left alone. So yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> Do we have more time? Okay. Um, actually, the this guy has been raising his hand for a while. Let's go to him first. Uh, the gentleman in the blue coat. Next to you. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Okay. Hi. Um, Assalamualaikum and good evening. My name is Amirul. I'm actually part of Shell Operators as well. I'm also representing the Asiata Young CEO Development Program. So I just want to say, this is, I start with a statement first. I just want to say that Pachit Shell, Pachit Shairan, he has helped a lot in terms of the Shell businesses. So, so thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You have inspired the side heroes a lot. I remember that when they come, you came over to my station, Banda Botanic, all the side heroes scramble around and say, oh, Pachit Shell datang, Pachit Shell datang. <laughs> and they want to get a... They, want, they all wanted to get a you know, Instagram post with you and such. <laughs> so being a, being a leader in the business, right, my concerns would be, because part of my day-to-day -day job is dealing with the less privilege. Mm -hmm. But they are, at the same time, they are brimmed with potentials, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So at times that it gets exhausting, okay? Be but there are times that you feel like you need to help them. Mm -hmm. So my question would be like, how can you let them know that you guys have the potential. You guys can change your own life with your own hands, but, but at the same time, they need to know that this cannot be done by others. It needs to come from your own self. <laughs> Thank you, Amiru. I, I will attempt a version of it, right? Uh, it's a, an important question. Uh, firstly, you mentioned something about a time for yourself when you can also get tired. Mm. That's the truth, right? Whether you are in whatever role that you do and certainly in sports and you need time for yourself yeah. too, right? So recognize that and make time for yourself. It may sound a little bit selfish, but figure out a way that you can recharge yourself. Yeah. Some people do yoga. Some people wake up at 5.30, do your morning prayers. Mm. Some people run. Find out what keep you energized physically and mentally, right? Because you cannot take care of other people unless you yourself are strong. Yeah? Start with that and don't feel selfish. And after that, realize also humbly that you cannot do it alone, right? That's why I actually love to come here. I was mm -hmm. awkward, nervous, but at, I can now maybe, right, provoke some things inside a few of you that you go out and do even greater things, mm. right? And that's how we, we make it infectious in a good way. Realize that you cannot do it alone, but keep driving it. Even if you can't convert everyone, ooh, five out of ten is not bad. Yes. Right? Yes, Obviously. totally. <laughs> you said it, well, I don't think I can top up that, right? <laughs> but no, um, I think you just have to know yeah, your limits. Um, we, you give it your all, but you cannot go over to help. I think that you can only give that much. And um, you have a team. I think, like you said, you have to know that the team is also there to help you. To, and you, once you already give that chance that your team to, to take over, you can give yourself a bit of space to then go, okay, I can take that time for myself. And because, like you said, if you don't have time for yourself, and I've experienced that in my squash career, that I started having uh, injuries, I, you know, I couldn't push myself in that last bit to gain those points that I needed to, and you're mentally just drained. But I needed to find those moments where I can just have those rests, um, take the breaks in between to make sure you refresh 
and start again. I think it works for everybody here. You're all working so hard. You have to know when it's time to just take that one day, even like just for yourself to recharge, regroup, re like get your mind completely off work. Um, maybe it's with friends, or maybe it's by yourself. You, you have to find out what works for you. And then you realize you have the energy to then take on the next week or the next, the next phase of that um, push to go forward. And yeah, I think that's the only way to go and to know your limits. But at the same time, just have that space for yourself too. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kat DZ. I'm the head of Gallery Petronas, actually. Um, I'm so honored to probably see this last few words because I'm sure it's already five plus. Thank you for such a great day, Karina, my colleague Nadia, and, and the rest of the awards team, and also the organizers, Cynthia, Esro Awani. I just love this. What keeps you all awake at night? That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you again. And Thank you. I hope to meet question. you guys again. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I, it's, it's not what worries me at night, right? Uh, it is a question that I remind myself, which is, what good have I done in my course of life that would outweigh all the bad things that I've done unintentionally? So... It doesn't keep me awake at night, but I periodically self-check myself in this journey called life. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, for me, I'm just, I think I sleep better now. <laughs> no, I think the first thing that comes to my head is that what keeps me awake is the things that I can do so much more to reach out. Like, how many kids can I impact? What else can I do to make them smile? What, what are the means that I can offer? Anything else do I have to offer? Um, I want to do that as much as I can for the foundation and, and maybe try and do other things um, that could reach out to even more people, to women, to girls, uh, to everybody that I could probably inspire somehow. That's what also keeps me awake. But I sleep well when I don't need to train the next day. <laughs> so, but thank you so much for having us here. I really appreciate sharing today and also so nice to be here with Inche Sharon. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, to Nicole and Cheshire. I think we all walk away with a lot to learn to digest for myself as well. So it's been a wonderful opportunity, as you said, um, to all of us here and um, that wraps up our discussion but I think bo both of you will stick around for a bit so yes get the cameras ready uh, for your <laughs> selfie um, I think with that we've come to the end and um, thank you so much uh, once again for all of you to be here this afternoon to share your time with us and we really really appreciate it thank you so much <laughs> <laughs>